Hi, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Julia May Jonas, presenting her debut novel, Vladimir, in conversation with Joanna Rakoff. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community. And every week we host events here on our Zoom account. Upcoming virtual events include Marlon James, Grace Lavery in conversation with Tori Bedford and Sarah Manguzo in conversation with Julie Oranger. Please check out the event schedule on our website at harvard.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates and to browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many as time allows. This event also will have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you are using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase copies of Vladimir on harvard.com. Your purchases make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We thank you so much for showing up and tuning in, not only in support of our authors and the author series, but also the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And uh, lastly, as you have likely experienced in virtual gatherings like this one, technical issues may arise. Of course, we hope that they do not, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. And we thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am very pleased to introduce our speakers. Julia May Jonas is a playwright and teaches theater at Skidmore College. She holds an MFA in playwriting from Columbia University and Vladimir is her debut novel. Joanna Rakoff is the author of the international best-selling memoir by Salinger Year and the novel A Fortunate Age, which was winner of the Goldberg Prize for Fiction, the L. Readers Prize, and a San Francisco Chronicle bestseller. Rakoff's books have been translated into 20 languages and have been nominated for major prizes internationally. She has written frequently for the New York Times, Vogue, Marie Claire, O, The Oprah Magazine, and many other publications. Tonight, they will be discussing uh, Vladimir, Julia May Jonas's novel. The Vladimir of the title is a hot young novelist to watch and the subject, excuse me, the object of obsession and envy for the book's narrator, an unnamed woman, an English professor in her mid fifties whose professor husband has been suspended from teaching pending an investigation of sexual misconduct with his former students. Amidst the high praise that Julia May Jonas's novel has received across many publications, my favorite line comes from the LA Times Review. Jonas, with a potent pumping voice, has drawn a character so powerfully candid that when she does things that are malicious, dangerous, and yes, predatory, we only want her to do them again. I am delighted <laughs> to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Julia and Joanna. Thank you, Now, I think um, you guys, uh, everyone out there, hello. Um, a little run of show. I think that Julia is gonna read a little bit um, and then we're just gonna get into it. Um, yay. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna read from a, a early part in the book um, when the narrator is recounting uh, an encounter that she had um, right when John, uh, when the accusations came out against John, who is her husband. So hopefully that's enough context. However, when the wave of accusations and the petition came, I found that suddenly everyone knew that I was the wife of the disgraced chair. Toward the end of the spring semester, I was sitting in my office when a group of five young women from my adaptations class entered, giggling with what was clearly their own self of se sense of self-importance and buoyed up enthusiasm they had roused in whatever cabal they'd had before. I invited them in and they exchanged daring glances until Casey, clad in a flowered baby doll and lace stockings with a Japanime hairstyle, 
two buns, one on each side of her head, a girl who would attach a pen cap to the fat bottom part of her lip during class and accidentally pull her shirt down so that one nipple was exposed, a girl who always laughed too loudly at anything the one very handsome boy said in class, stepped forward. We wanted to talk to you, um, she said. Okay, I said. They were already annoying me. They were an annoying bunch. Individually, I'm able to drum up most of the time a sense of patience and tolerance for each student, even the extremely grating ones. I don't know what happens in one's youth to make one student so tolerable, so pleasant, so secure in themselves, so eager to learn, and what makes other students so irritating. But I pride myself on not discriminating against them because of it. With most of my students, I'm able to understand their need to be seen, and I'm able to focus on that need and let their ticks and blips, their entitlements, their insecurities or overconfidences simply wash past. I'm able to see them in progress and to know them in progress to know that they don't yet fully grasp what they are presenting to the world as they present it. But if even irritating students can be withstood individually and pleasant students can be excellent company, students in groups are always awful. They get too much bravery from each other, they forget to behave well. The interaction with this group led by Manic Pixie Casey was bound to be painful. Well, um, we just wanted to say, um, Becca, a tall girl who took her emotions as seriously as cancer, wearing a baggy turtleneck over baggy dress, over baggy pants. Joke, how do you get into a hippie's pants? Take off her skirt first. Stepped up. Well, we just wanted to say like, you don't, you don't have to like do the whole supportive silent wife thing. I breathed in white hot anger rushing up my forearms into my elbows. Then Tabitha in her mechanics jumpsuit worn unbuttoned to the waist so that her bra was visible, stepped forward. Like you're this hot, brilliant lady. We think you're really hot. I could tell they prized their own opinion of my hotness, their ability to appreciate hotness in an older woman. And like, it is totally unfair what he's done to us. You, I asked. Us women, she said. Ah, I said, not you personally. Casey stepped forward again. We just want to know when you're going to dump his ass. Because you should, someone in the chorus piped up. Careful, 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 I thought to myself. Careful. We professors talked about it all the time. Nowadays, you must be so careful. It's good. It's good, we would say to each other. It's good that there's safety. Though we all wondered what we were preparing these students for with all our carefulness, as if the world was going to continue being as careful. But then again, maybe it was, we would say. Maybe if these were the people who were in the world who were comprising the professional culture, then the world would have no choice except to be more careful. And that would be a good thing. People said this crop of youth was weak, but we knew differently. We knew they were so strong, so much stronger than us and equipped with better weapons, more effective tactics. They brought us to our knees with their softness, their consistent demand for the consideration of their feelings. The way they could change all we thought would stay the same for the rest of our lives be it stripping naked for male directors and undergraduate productions of the Bacchae, ignoring racist statements and supposedly great works of literature, or working for less when others were paid more. They had changed all that we hadn't been able to, and our only defense was to call them soft. They had God and their friends and the internet on their side. And perhaps they would make a better world for themselves. Their aim was not to break taboos the way people born 10 to 20 years before me and in a small way my generation had done, no, they worked in a subtler and stricter way. And perhaps it had to be so. And so careful, I told myself. No anger, no personal attacks, just grace, grace, grace. The girl stood nervously in front of me waiting for my response. I cultivated warmth in my chest and brought it up to my face. I pushed the warmth through my smile, letting it settle around my eyes. I wanna thank you for coming to see me. I'm flattered on two accounts for calling me a hot lady and for the care that you're extending toward me. It makes me feel hopeful for the future to be surrounded by young women who are as passionate and empathetic as you are. Sit down, I urged them, and they crammed onto the couch in its arms facing me. We all live and work within structures and institutions, I told them. We can't help it. I work, I live inside of institutional sexism, racism, and homo and transphobia, for example. 
And the difficult thing to understand about these institutions is that we all, however aware of it we are or not, practice sexism, racism, and homo or transphobia, even if we are female, a person of color, or homosexual or trans person. And so I'm fully willing to admit that my remaining with my husband, not standing by his actions necessarily, but simply remaining in relationship to him may be a product of my own internalized sexism. Certainly, how could it not be? Right, said Casey, a band of saliva visible in her open mouth. That said, and I say this again with such deep gratitude for the care you've extended toward me, that my husband and I have had a life together longer than any of you have been alive. And we've had agreements and arrangements and compromises throughout that time and challenges. We're now faced with another challenge, both a public challenge and a private challenge. I know that you will understand if I beg for your understanding and respect of my privacy as I decide for myself as a hot, brilliant lady, how I will handle my marriage of 30 years. Extending me that courtesy is an act of feminism in and of itself. 10 minutes later, I closed the door to my office, waving and blowing kisses as they beamed at me. Assholes, I thought. I love that passage and I feel like it so perfectly encapsulates the book in a certain way and the world of the book. So I'm so glad you chose it. It's one of my favorites. Um, okay, I have so many questions for you. And I'm before I get into them, I'm just gonna take a moment to say how excited I am to be in conversation with you. Um, I read this book, um, everyone out there, I read this book a few months ago um, because uh, friend of mine, um, uh, the New York Times editor, Sarah Wildman, read it and not just told me I had to read it, but sort of posted on Instagram saying, Joanna Rico, this is the book for you. You have to read it. <laughs> That's how suited she thought it was to me. And she was correct. And I, after reading it, sort of told everyone that I knew that they had to read it. And I feel like all of my friends and I are now in this little kind of Vladimir fan club. <laughs> um, and let read the book, not the person. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> so anyway, I've done so many events like this, but this is one in which I just, I've been kind of like bouncing off the walls. So excited to talk to you. I, have, I genuinely have questions. I didn't need to actually work very hard to come up with them. <laughs> so before we start talking, I just want to tell everyone out there that um, the way this will work is we'll talk for, you know, maybe half an hour or so, and then we'll turn to your questions. Um, but as as we talk, I will be monitoring the, the Q&A box at the bottom. And when a, a decent number of questions amass, you know, let's just say four or five, we'll stop and turn to your questions. So as questions arise for you, please type them into the Q&A box um, rather than kind of waiting until the last minute so that I can gauge how much time we need for your questions, because that's really probably more important than mine. <laughs> so, um, okay. So in the section you read, we really see this. Um, so, I mean, this, this novel offers so many pleasures, but I feel like the greatest pleasure is the narrative voice, this kind of urgent, iconoclastic, bombastic, hilarious narrative voice. And so I want to start with that. I was so curious as to whether this novel started with the voice or whether it started with something else, whether it started with, you know, an idea that you wanted to talk about the sexual politics of our time. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about where it began, like the seed, the germ of it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the novel, well, the original seed was uh, actually in 2018. I had this idea that I wanted to write a play um, about the wives or a wife of someone who had been involved in a kind of Me Too style uh, scandal. Um, and so I started writing this play, but the play was actually, you know, as, as these things are, you know, art doesn't actually follow how you want it to go necessarily. The play wasn't really about the wife. She, she was a character, she was one character and there were many other characters and it became kind of a riff about, about desire and consent and agency and how we talk about desire and, and uh, you know, how we, how we interpret it, how we write about it. Um, and I got to a certain point with the play and I, the play just didn't work. I couldn't finish it. I think I got to around 75 pages. Um, and so I put it away 
but I remembered this one particular character who was this professor's wife. Um, and there was this initial scene where she was showing a younger colleague all of her stuff in her house, um, all of her kind of cultural artifacts. And, uh, you know, I kept, and I kept thinking about that character. Um, that, that was my favorite scene from the play. And I kept thinking about that character in particular. And then when the pandemic happened, um, I, I wrote the first chapter in her voice using in many ways, you know, the voice that I kind of discovered in that scene. And once I wrote the first chapter, I felt like, oh, okay, I think I could, I can put, I can make this into a book. This is a book. She's a book. <laughs> um, and, and that, you know, what was missing about the play, what kind of made the play not work was very available in the novel, which is like, we needed to be inside of her head. We needed to feel all of the nuances of her thought. We needed to hear her go back and forth, her rationalizations, her justifications, her, her resistances, but also acceptances. And, and so, and so the novel I knew, you know, it, it was like, <laughs> it was like the meeting of, of two elements, the prose form and her, and that was the thing that made the most sense. And so, so that's really how the voice kind of came, came out. That makes total sense. I mean, so theater, playwriting is ultimately kind of a collaborative form, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're, you're, obviously you're writing a play by yourself just as you would a novel, but ultimately, you know, the, the sort of final product is the result of a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how did you find it turning to the novel um, in which you kind of have full control of that world? And it just is going to stay the way you made it. Was it was it really exciting? Yes. Well, I mean, I mean, you said it exactly the way it is. I mean, it, it felt like thrilling and almost illicit that I was actually writing something that was not going to be have another level of interpretation before it met, you know, its audience. Um, and and it really felt, um, you know, I felt liberated. I think as a writer, I felt like all of a sudden, in a way. Plays are so, plays are very challenging and to write. Um, good plays are like magic tricks. They're like perfectly worded jokes, you know, not a, not a thing can be out of place in a really good play. Um, uh, and not that, not that novels are, are necessarily should be baggy in any way, but, but you have more room because it's not a durational form. Um, and because you're not having to make things because you can just be as clear as you want to be. Um, and so that that idea that I could be as clear as I wanted to be and take the time, all of the time that I needed to, to get, you know, get the actual moment across, that that was, you know, felt really liberating and, and fun. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Is it, I mean, this is a little bit of an aside, but I'm curious um, because I, I sort of witnessed, I, this is not germane at all, but my husband runs um, the music and theater department at MIT here. And so I've witnessed a lot of directors, playwrights, you know, over the course of the pandemic. Um, and I also, I'm a former actress, I have friends in theater and what have you. I've witnessed a lot of people who sort of really thrived on the collaborative, collaborative aspect of their work. And also just, you know, I don't know, being in the world, like producing a piece of culture that was physically in the world um, have a really, really hard time. And I wonder, like, is it a coincidence that you started writing this during the pandemic when you didn't have anything in production? It was, I mean, it was not a coincidence. It was the thing that helped me like push it through to the end for, for sure. I have had many 50 page drafts of novels that I have, uh, or many is, is an overstatement, but, but at least three or four that I have shelved because a play opportunity has come around and I've said, oh, that seems so fun. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go be with people or that seems so immediate, you know? I, I can have a really immediate feedback loop um, if I can bring that play, because, you know, a play is, is, is so, it's really such a short form. You know, I teach playwriting and I always tell my students, it's not a lot of words. That's what you have to understand. The word count is quite low. You can write a play in a week. Uh, 
revising a play is, is a process that takes many, 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 many people and months of work. You know, that's the tricky thing. It's like, it can't, you can't get into an editing process with a play without a cast and designers and a director. Um, so, so that's, those are the challenges. And that's why theater is such a financially difficult medium to work in <laughs> because it requires so much to even get it started. Um, uh, but, but the pandemic helped me, you know, focus and, and the playwright is really kind of the two sides of the spectrum. I mean, when it comes to the collaboration aspect, because you always need some time by yourself and then it's fun to have the collaboration come out of that, but you do need to write the play by yourself. Um, and so you do have a writing practice that is, that is alone and solitary. Um, uh, and so you know, the fact that I couldn't enter into collaborative practice and didn't really want to because theater didn't exist. It felt so, it felt really impossible for me to write something for a form that actually didn't exist at the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yes. like, um, but, but the thing that I was finding so much solace in were the novels that I was reading. And, and, and so that's, that's what gave me the permission to do it. And that said, I really did you know, fall in love with the form and, and want to continue with it. I mean, every, every form has its benefits and drawbacks emotionally. And there's some, there's, you know, there's loneliness and patience when you're writing a full length book. Um, but that sense of control, I just, I felt like that was uh, uh, revelatory, you know. Yeah, it's exhilarating. Yeah. <laughs> um, you teach at Skidmore. Mm -hmm. um, and a college not dissimilar from the fictional college in Vladimir. And I wondered if your experiences informed the book um, or, or just in the most minor way or in a more major way. I mean, I think, I think texturally, I couldn't have written the book if I didn't teach at Skidmore. You know, I mean, I think from a texture point of view, and this is a very grandiose comparison, but I'll make it just because it's the most obvious one, which is like, Herman Melville couldn't have written Moby Dick unless he unless he went on a whaling ship, you know, <laughs> he needed he needed to have that texture um, and I needed the texture of the college. But mm, I there were no scandal. I've never been involved in a scandal either departmentally or, you know, certainly not personally or anything like that. Um, I have witnessed changing of the rules. You know, I've seen. I've seen very small incidences of professors, especially older ones, flounder or, you know, be flummoxed by things shifting underneath them. And that has been something very interesting to observe, um, especially because, you know, when you're inside of these departments, you feel for these professors who have, you know, very much like the narrator Vladimir, they've always been on the right side of history. You know, they've always felt themselves to be progressive, um, you know, and, and they, they, they think they're, they believe that they're, um, you know, that no matter how things are interpreted, you know, their intention is good. Um, and, you know, and I've seen the world shifting underneath them in a way that they've had to kind of edit and constantly revise their behavior in certain ways and how that can be painful. Um, so, so that, you know, working at Skidmore gave me all of that, as well as a sense of just what it's like to be in a cold, sleepy town, even though I don't, I don't live there permanently. I live in Brooklyn, but I did, I did go up and direct a show there for a semester. And I think just being in the, the way it felt and the way it looked and the coldness and the darkness of it, um, I think fed, fed the novel, you know. Yes, there is definitely that that sense of, I don't know why I keep saying, but telling you these random things, but my mother's, my fa my maternal family is from Gloversville, which is well, basically one town over. And you, yeah. I felt like you really accurately portray this sort of just kind of icy gloom of winter in that area, you know, where the day feels like two hours long. Yes. <laughs> like sun rises and you have like one minute before it sets. It's so dark. Yeah, I mean, speaking of, you know, uh, non sequiturs, when I was up there, I got chillblains, like a Victorian orphan. I, I, because it is so cold. <laughs> um, so, and the cold is so relentless. Um, so, so yes, all of that yeah. gave, gave me 
uh, gave me some texture to think about. <laughs> yeah, there's a kind of rawness. And I suppose there's also a kind of isolation to that area. I've, I've been to Skidmore a few times and definitely there is a sense of kind of isolation even just on the campus. I also went to a college similar to Skidmore and there was also a sense of isolation on the campus. Like you're in your, this own, your own discrete universe, which I think is really important to the novel that it's kind of like almost like a hothouse environment. Um, that yeah, it's a hothouse. And usually they're set in towns and areas that don't, I mean, and certainly in, in Vladimir it is, they're set, they're these little enclaves inside of areas that are not, you know, that don't share political values with that enclave. Um, and yeah. so there's a real tension with college people and non-college people. Um, you know, it's not like, I mean, I, I went, I got both my degrees in New York City. Like, it's not like, it's not like that. <laughs> where you feel like your whole world is that, you know, a continuous cultural project. It really feels like you're in a small bubble, um, you know, and then, and then there's the rest of the world. Definitely. And I think that's part of like the issue, the sort of issues and also in a way, and I guess we'll move on to this in a second, like the, the kind of interpersonal relationships even those that are not central to one's life sometimes become magnified and dramas become magnified because it's this kind of little bubble universe um, in a way that maybe they don't. And I don't know, I, I also did my graduate work at Columbia and it didn't feel that way. It felt like everyone had their own lives and they came and went yes. and yeah, it's very different. Um, yeah, I mean, there's less of a likelihood that you know, I mean, my favorite, my favorite narrative is a stranger comes to town and everyone, you know, goes wild. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, there's not that possibility when you live in a big city, you know, because, yeah. or, or there's much less, I mean, there, you're always interacting with strangers. Um, but, you know, small towns, everyone can all of a sudden start to start to ping off the new stranger who comes. Um, and so, and, and you need, you need that smallness to make that narrative possible. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. So moving on to your narrator and Vladimir, um, like a little, going a little bit deeper. Okay. So she is a woman in her late fifties and which, I mean, that in and of itself feels kind of radical, which is bizarre in this day and age. I, um, was actually trying to think of other novels that feature a heroine of this age. And, you know, I really couldn't think of very many, especially in American fiction, like in British fiction, there's more, but, you know, the, the only comparable novel I could think of was Alison Lurie's Foreign Affairs, which is mm -hmm. about a woman of the same age who does kind of have like a, I'm just gonna use the term sexual awakening, which is wrong and cheesy, but, there's a similar kind of arc to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I wondered if I know you set out to write about a woman of this generation. And I wondered, you know, as in someone who was kind of grew up in a sort of different value system and is kind of adjusting to what is happening now in the sort of the sexual politics of this particular moment. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about why um, this, like why you chose to, or like why this was fascinating to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Why her predicament, like her age, her station was fascinating to you. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first, as you said, you know, I was, I am just, always interested in characters who the world for whatever reason the world is shifting underneath them that they they think they have something figured out and then um the ground changes and and they're forced to to reckon with that because i think that's something that in certain ways you know and sometimes in even small ways but um as you get older, you encounter these, you encounter these moments where you feel like you look around and say, oh, the world is different. Okay. And sometimes it's a good thing. And sometimes it's a bad thing. And sometimes it's very small. Um, uh, but I, but I am interested in that, in that phenomenon. Um, and then I also, as I was writing, remember I was at a party and talking to a friend, I mean, this, and this question had been floating in my mind and I, and I asked her, you know, I'm like, 
did you have an assumption that you will want less when you get older? Um, and she said, she said, I do have that assumption, but I'm angry about it. And I don't think it's true. <laughs> and, and so that was really a huge core of what I was trying to explore in the novel. You know, that question about, you know, feeling as though there's, we, we hold this idea that somehow we're going to smooth out all our edges and become just more and more, um, uh, satisfied with our existence, however marginalized it may be, become more grateful and want less. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, I, as someone who has never felt like I've shortchanged myself in any way, you know, the fact that I had that assumption, you know, I, I, I just, all of a sudden I thought, oh, that's, that's the thing that I want to explore is, is what's, how does, what is your relationship to your desire? Um, and that's not to say we should all have, you know, um, very intense sexual obsessions on younger colleagues, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it certainly felt like that was something that I could start to, I could, I could feel the, the question arising in that. And, and that, you know, because the Me Too stuff, I mean, it's interesting and it's the subject. And I think plays are kind of more, you know, uh, at least in the case of the, in the case of this, like plays can tend to be more subject oriented, whereas a novel can be more character oriented. Um, so, you know, there was the subject that was the seed and that's all there in the book. But the real, you know, thing that's propelling the character is that question about desire and, and what is her relationship to her desire and me trying to kind of write out this, this expectation um, and, and write through it, try and figure that out for myself. I love that. And I mean, part of what um, makes the novel and, and your narrator so complex, but is that, I mean, I think that we've seen a number of novels that are kind of written from her, the husband's perspective, right? Her, like, um, and like, I'm thinking of books like Blue Angel, like that kind of thing. Um, there are a bunch of them. There are a ton of them actually. Mm -hmm. And what, and her relationship with her students, like in the scene that you just read, there's this just wonderful kind of irony in that they're saying to her, you know, you're this hot lady, but what they expect of her is to almost kind of live a nun-like existence. Like they, the life of, you know, the kind of older, the aunt character in like a Jane Austen novel or something that right. she's, she's there to kind of be their handmaiden, you know, and do their bidding and um, kind of escort them into, you know, the world of literature, but she, but her time is done and she is not a person who can have any sort of um, sexual voli volition, you know, mm -hmm. for herself. Right, like they want her to just sort of sit back and retire from the world, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so true. And I think I think it's also a very interesting thing to think particularly about college students because they're coming off of childhood, which is a very egomaniacal time, you know, and, and childhood is not a time when you think about other people or develop empathetic skills. Um, <laughs> you could know, uh, uh, try some, some, maybe some children do, but I think in general, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a focused, it's a self-focused time. Um, and then, and then college is, is a pretend world in which they all of a sudden have to broaden their focus to other people. And I think, you know, in ways they can very easily do that with their peers. Um, and so they can find a lot of inspiration and things from your peers. But yes, I mean, I think their professors feel like people who are, um, and, and this all sounds kind of pejorative to students, but I don't even mean it to be. They're there, they're there to serve them um, and, and not there, not there uh, to necessarily have their own wants or desires. And as, you know, and I feel like, especially as female professors get older, you know, I mean, the fact that she's called hot is actually kind of nice versus what I feel like most older female professors get called, which is like cute or momish or she's she or antish, you know, that that's that's really what they want her to be. Um, and, and yeah. 
Yeah. Or there's also the archetype of the kind of like cold, scary, severe old yeah. professor. <laughs> yes. You yes. Know, the other, you know, who also is completely asexual and. Um, right. Kind but, of very, very dour and serious uh, uh, without any sort of kind of uh, warmth or, or wetness around. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I see we have a bunch of questions. Um, so I'm going to quickly ask you the one question that I've been dying to ask you, and then I'm going to move on to everyone else. Okay, which is this. So throughout the book, I mean, I would say like throughout the first, let's say just two thirds, three quarters of the book, the narrator is, I thought of her almost as kind of a voice of sanity in a world gone insane. Mm -hmm. um, like she kind of, she's kind of a truth teller who's cuts through all bullshit that comes her way kind mm -hmm. of um and she's so um completely aware and understanding of everything going on around her in such a kind of um brilliant sensitive but very realistic way mm -hmm. um and at the end of the novel and I feel like I'm it's okay to talk about this because we know from the beginning right that Vladimir is shackled to a chair. So mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not giving anything away here, but toward, toward the end of the novel, not the very end, but toward the end, the final third, she kind of veers into this territory that a friend of mine described as bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and the novel takes a really sort of different turn that like could be construed as a darker turn it could be construed as a more almost absurdist turn mm -hmm. you know like a, a veer away from realism I've also thought of it as kind of actually a more cinematic turn in a way um and I wondered okay so my big question I have these two twined together questions which are like how did you decide to take her kind of off the rails mm -hmm. and like out of societal norms. Cause she's so intelligent about societal norms. She gets mm -hmm. them and then she makes this decision, this conscious decision to kind of be like, no, I'm going to do this totally crazy thing. Mm -hmm. um, and did you ever consider kind of keeping the novel within the realm of kind of like the comedy of manners campus novel and not making this kind of big choice at the end um yeah uh well um so I mean I think I think I'll I'll, tr I'll attempt to answer in a formal way and then and then maybe answer in a character way you know I from a formal perspective like I I have always loved books that kind of start in one place um which is like a set you know like you said a kind of psychologically realistic place and then um and then you're you're seduced by this you're seduced by the psychological realism you're on the side of the character and then all of a sudden um they become <laughs> irrational and they start to do things and and you know and they do something um you know where you say oh my goodness i can't, i can't believe that person just did that and you have this <laughs> moment you know of of recognition with yourself where you're, I mean, it's all fiction, right? Um, but you, you have this moment of recognition with yourself where you realize um, that you had expectations for how this person would behave and, and you had an idea of how you thought they, what you thought they were going to do and they did, and they upended those expectations. So I have just always liked that form. I mean, that's kind of a, a, a cheeky answer, but I have always liked that form where, where all of a sudden you go, I can't believe this is happening inside of this book <laughs> that I thought I knew what it was in one way and now something else is happening. Um, and, uh, and then I, I also am very interested in characters who, um, you know, who cross uh, thresholds, you know, that there are these thresholds that exist around us and we have fantasies about crossing those thresholds all of the time. And I think, um, and, and yet we don't, you know, we keep ourselves back from it. And, you know, a, a psychological term could be called like intrusive thoughts or things like that. Um, and those, those kind of intrusive thoughts, you know, those ideas, you know, they, they, they strike me with such fear. Um, they make me so terrified, those thoughts. Um, 
And I think especially any, you know, mother who has kids has a million intrusive thoughts a day. That's exactly uh, what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mother, especially like with an infant. And, yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it, it's, it's such an interesting, um, it's such an interesting tyranny, you know, to live with those thoughts happening, happening all the time. And so, uh, you know, and I became, I, I, you know, things like this happen all the time. And, and, um, you know, if you look at your, her actions, I mean, no, I don't, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but in a way they're bad, but how bad are they? You know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're definitely unhinged, but, but you know, what, what ends up happening is actually not so far um, from what she does is, is not so damaging in that, in that moment where she ties him up. Um, uh, but I was interested in this idea of a character crossing a threshold of, and of being, entranced by the idea of crossing a threshold because I think that's what I think is so alluring for her is this idea that she could cross this threshold she who is you know you even if even in that scene I just read you know she knows what to say she's keeping it under wraps she's solving all the problems you know she is she's wild in her thoughts but her actions have been so restrained she's been a very devoted mother she's a very devoted in a way wife always taking care of her husband um even as even as these things go forward and and i was i, I wanted to think about a character who is seduced by the idea of doing the wrong thing for once you know i love that okay i'm gonna move on to these many questions actually okay so marie asks um you've written such a vivid protagonist why did you decide not to name her oh yes well i felt like we needed to be inside of her you know in order to really feel um you know if i if i gave her a name and i don't even have a name for her in my head um if i gave still to this day um and you know i was working on describing her with someone they were saying you know can we have a shorthand can we give her a name and i said no we can call her you know the letter b um maybe but I, I just don't want to name her. And I think the reason is because I feel like, you know, once she has a name, she's over here. She becomes an object that we're looking at. And the thing I was interested in, in exploring is her gaze, her desire, feeling like we're inside of her body and inside of her mind. And I feel like the minute we started to name her, we would, we would get away from that. We would start to see her as, you know, this person um, right. rather, rather than kind of, you know, be in the current of her thoughts in the way we needed to be. That makes total sense. I so get that. Um, why did you title, oh, this is from Alyssa asks, why did you title the book Vladimir? He seems a peripheral character, almost a boring character in my opinion, but certainly the name is attention getting. And then she says, thank you, thank you, thank you for this brilliant work of art. Looking forward <laughs> to what's next from Julia May Jonas. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you know, books written by men about obsessions with women tend to have the women's name as, as the book, let's say. And I'll say, you know, I'll just say, um, obviously, there's Lolita uh, as, as the kind of prime example that I think people think of in terms of this book. And the idea is, is that it's kind of exactly the reason that I didn't name the protagonist is that Vladimir is an object. He's unknowable to her, you know, and, and she can't actually fully see him, but she projects everything onto him. I mean, Vladimir is not Vladimir. Vladimir is her disappointments with her life. He's, she, he's her wishing that she could start again. He's uh, her wishing that she was, had been a better received writer at the time that she was writing. Um, you know, he represents like a clean slate at this college that they've come to, you know, he represents being a young parent to a kid, you know, when she is missing being a parent, um, which I think is something that also threads throughout the book. Uh, so, so in that way, it is all about, it's all about gaze. Um, and so I wanted to play with that idea of, of, um, you know, naming the book in a nod to that gaze. You know, you never know exactly who Lolita is. Um, you, she, she's not, she's not a character. She's a manifestation of Humbert Humbert's um, fantasies. So, yeah, so that was even her name. <laughs> yes, you know, 
Yeah. I mean, it's not even her name, right? Her name is Dolores, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So he, he yeah. gives her a new name so that he can project all of his desires onto her. And in that way, you know, Vladimir is, um, is, is a thing, is a, is a being that, that she can present, project her desires onto. Okay. Sriya asks, is there room for the reader to observe Vladimir, the man, as a good man, considering the fact that a lot of assumptions about him were made by a professor who is obsessed with him, not viewing him differently, more equally, perhaps? Yeah, I, I get the sense of the question. Um, um, the book in, you know, in many ways is, is, is an exploration of how difficult it is to truly see other people. Um, and so I don't know if there's a possibility to, uh, to necessarily know who he is, uh, beyond the narrator's perception. Um, but I, but I think you can, you, I think what you do know is that you're not getting necessarily the whole story, um, uh, on him and that that's part of you know, that's part of what the book is, you know, is about the fact that she's so blocked in her perception um, and, and in her storytelling about him, you know, she's made him into a piece of literature, um, you know, in this way. Uh, uh, and, and that prevents her from seeing him fully. And maybe, you know, and I think there is room to read between some lines um, to see who he is. But I, I also think it's impossible because the book is about her perspective and her perspective is, is so strong um, and so seductive uh, that, it, that it becomes tricky. Okay, I'm gonna, there's another question from Sriya, but I'm just gonna skip to a few other people's questions and then we'll go back to that. Um, this is from Jim. I'm halfway through your wonderful book. There are several encounters the narrator has with rude, threatening, harassing strangers who are men. For example, the stranger who approaches in the state park, the burly guy with the plumber's crack at the diner <laughs> who ogles her daughter. I'm curious about your thoughts for including these characters in juxtaposition to the other main male characters, Vladimir, her husband, John, etc. Yeah, I mean, excellent observation because that's something I feel like that people don't really necessarily pick up on um, at that the narrator despite kind of pushing for agency uh, uh, of the women at the college um, and and you know of course it's like a very gray area with John because these relationships were consensual at the time but but pushing for the agency in general with these women I think one thing she doesn't she's not completely candid about is how threatened she feels consistently by men um and and how uh you know as you go through the novel she has several kind of very you know either mortifying humiliating or or little scarring moments with men that pop up throughout uh the narrative, the, the narrative. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, s s some of that was the way that the narrator just unfolded and me thinking about her history and her relationship to men. And some of it, I really wanted to show these, these cracks that she's attempting to, you know, that, that desire is in a way an attempt to grab power but that she still feels in many ways powerless um, in, inside of this world, um, you know, and, and whether she should feel that way or not, you know, there's, there's no judgment about that, but it's, it's absolutely true that she does. And, and she can't necessarily take, uh, even as she, as she longs for agency, she doesn't, she doesn't necessarily have it. Yeah. And, one thing, one question that I didn't get to ask you is related to this. Um, I'm so happy, Jim, that you asked this question um, because I just, um, I kept thinking as I read it that it was such a wonderful portrait of the kind of dangers and pleasures of being a woman alone. Because even though she's married, she really is living her life completely separately from John mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there are this sort of, inverse and opposite of those horrible kind of scary moments, which every woman has had mm -hmm. too many to even, if we thought about them all, we would just want to curl up and die. 
basically, um, or never leave our houses. But the sort of inverse and opposite of that is like when she, there are all these moments where she has these incredible kind of solitary pleasures, like of eating delicious food on her own and what have you. So anyway, um, yeah, it, I feel like another way of reading the book is this portrait of a woman on her own, like traversing the world on her own and making sense of it. And okay, so let me, sorry, move on to other people. Um, Jim Hayes also says, thank you for this interview. Um, okay. So we have a few, I'm gonna go back to Surya, who's asked a few questions, who asks, did the book somewhere become a radical or rather a feminist retelling of Nabokov's Lolita? Or do you think it's offensive to go down that line of reasoning? You've touched on this a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't actually even as, you know, it's, it's funny because doing talking about the book, you know, sometimes you learn about a book through talking about it. Um, you know, I have become more and more aware of, of the, uh, resonances that it has with Lolita. Not that I didn't, not that I didn't, um, know that there was some kind of resonances, but I hadn't really thought of it as a, as a rewrite, um, or, a, a reimagining of that, of that story. Uh, when I when I set out to write it, and I I don't think it fully is, um, you know, for many reasons. One because there's just a you know there's just a lot of agency um, that people have inside of it, uh, even even when the narrator kind of crosses that threshold. But you know, she there are consenting adults involved um, uh, across the board. I think uh, so. That's that's in some way many different, uh, very different, um, you know. But I I did think about kind of Nabokov's pet obsession, which is, um, you know, which is, which is people being uh, captivated or caught by their desires or their, their obsessions um, and how, a, you know, a kind of a desire can perpetuate more desire can, can be, can become a story to perpetuate more desire and then becomes another story. And, and the way we start to, uh, rationalize and, 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 uh, you know, obsess in a way that to, to, to make solid our obsessions, you know, um, which I think his characters do kind of across all of his books, um, or a lot of them. Um, and so that, that in particular, I was interested in thinking about. Thank you, Sophia. I, that was one of my questions that I didn't get to ask, basically. Um, I think we basically have answered all questions, but I just want to say a couple of people um, have not really asked questions, but they're just sort of seeing how much they love the book. Um, one person um, says, full disclosure, I haven't finished the book because I don't want it to end. That's how much I love it. And, <laughs> um, and Sria, who asked a couple of questions, just says, um, thank you for the wonderful novel. Can't wait to see what you come up with next. Um, and then tells us that it's 5 30 a.m. where um is <laughs> coming to this room so it shows you how much how loved the book is oh um, I thank you so much I I so appreciate it <laughs> so I think that um we're that's it that's all we have time for <laughs> sorry I thought I'd pop back on uh, thank you so much to both of you this was such a, a delightful and stimulating conversation I've uh, reposted uh, the link to purchase copies of Vladimir if you haven't done so already clearly you, you're already hearing from the q a uh, it already has a lot of fans so check it out you should be one too and uh yeah once again thanks so much for joining us tonight and everyone just stay safe and happy reading and have a lovely evening and once again julia and joanna thank you so much to both of you thank you so much all right bye bye